morning, everyone. Welcome back to the UBC Learning Circle. Together with uh, URSI, its Indigenous Research Support Initiative, we are very pleased to be joined in the circle today by Lisa Jackson, Karen Ricolet, David Gartner, and Dallas Hunt. Today, uh, we're all going to be discussing Indigenous futuristic re or futurist research and pedagogies. Um, to be honest with you, uh, I don't know a lot about the topic, so I'm really excited to be learning alongside of each and every one of you, and I'm very happy that Lisa has uh, has um, has accepted the responsibility of moderating so that uh, so that I don't have to embarrass myself a little bit. <laughs> um, before we get into anything else, I would like to acknowledge the the learning circle zooming in from the traditional, ancestral, unceded, and occupied territories of the Hunkamina speaking Musqueam people. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle and allowing us to have these sorts of conversations together. So a gentle reminder here, the topics we cover can sometimes be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Um, if that's you for today, please make sure that you're looking after yourself. If at any point you feel that you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, family member, don't hesitate to do so. Whatever that support network looks like for you, please make sure that you're engaging in that. Uh, so introductions. My name is Cole. I'm from the Chowethel First Nation. Um, I'll be hanging out with you guys today, sharing our digital space, but uh, off camera is Cynthia, our production coordinator, and Emily and Julie join us from Mercy as well. So if you feel so inclined, please introduce yourselves in the chat box so we can kind of get the get the dialogue started. On to the um, on to kind of introducing our, our guest today. Dallas Hunt is an assistant professor in the Department of English Language and Literature at the University of British Columbia. He is Korean, a member of um, a Swan River First Nation in Treaty 8 territory in Northern, Northern Alberta, Canada. He's had creative and critical work published in the Malahat Review, Arc Poetry, Canadian Literature, and the American Indian Culture and Research Journal. His first children's book, Awasis and the World Famous Bannock, was published through Highwater Press in 2018 and was nominated for the Elizabeth Mrasek Cleaver Canadian Picture Book Award. His next book, Creeland, will be available through Nightwood, Nightwood Editions in March, 2021. Welcome to Alice. Karen Recolet, Cree born in Sturgeon Lake, First Nation, uh, Canada, lives in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and is an urban Cree scholar, artist, and writer whose work focuses on relationality and care as both an analytic and tech, technology for indigenous movement-based forms of inquiry within urban spaces. Uh, Recolet works collaboratively with Indigenous dance makers and scholars to theorize forms of urban glyphing uh, and is in conversation with dance choreographers, Black and Indigenous futurist thinkers, and Indigenous and Black geographers as ways to theorize and activate futurist, feminist, celestial, and decolonial landing relationships with more than human kinships and each other. David Gartner is a settler scholar of German descent and an assistant professor, professor sorry, with the Institute of Critical Indigenous Studies at UBC. His articles have appeared in Canadian Literature, American Indian Culture and Research Journal, and Bioethical Inquiry, among other publications. He is the editor of uh, so Sokeita, sorry, I apologize if I'm butch butchering that, The Poetry of Sky Dancer, Louise Bernice Half and Read Listen. Oh, and tell Indigenous stories from Turtle Island with Sophie McCall, Deanna Redder, and Gabrielle Lerondel Hill. His most recent book, The Theatre of Regret, Literature, Art, and Politics of Reconciliation in Canada, which contends with reconciliation in Canada as it is articulated through Indigenous futurisms, is now available from UBC Press. And finally, Lisa Jackson, um, just give me a moment here. Lisa Jackson is joining us as a moderator. Um, Lisa, would you mind uh, introducing yourself? I seem to have lost your, your bio. I really apologize for that. It was just here. Sorry about that. No problem. Hi, um, thanks Cole. Uh, I'm Lisa Jackson. I am coming to you from Toronto. Uh, I am a mixed Anishinaabe settler uh, from the Amgenong First Nation, which is near Sarnia, Ontario, and I uh, am a filmmaker, and um, I have been making films and other forms of media, including VR, uh, IMAX film, and multimedia installation uh, for quite a while, and some of my work has intersected 
with uh, Indigenous futurisms. And um, I also want to say that uh, Toronto is the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and the uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, as well as the Huron-Wendat people. Um, and I'm very honored to be invited to um, speak with all of you about your work today and delve into Indigenous futurisms. Am I taking over here? I was just going to say thanks very much for rec rescuing me there and uh, welcome everybody to the Learning Circle. We're really excited. Take it away, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Cole. Thank you to UBC, Dave, and the other panelists for having me. Um, it's an honor. Uh, I was lucky enough to also be on a panel yesterday with uh, Karen Recolet uh, on similar topics um, through U of T, and uh, it was uh, really rich and exciting, and there wasn't enough time. So um, I'm excited to dive in, and we'll try to um, cover as much territory as we can, or do we need to? That seems a little Euro-Western, but um, uh, let me give some introductions and then uh, I will uh, launch into discussion with the panelists. And I just wanna let people know uh, we are gonna be doing a Q&A. We're gonna play it a little bit by ear, but uh, do share your questions in the Q&A uh, box or whatever. And uh, we'll loop back to them somewhere in the last half hour um, of the conversation. So um, looking forward to that. So uh, by way of introduction, um, I want to give a couple of acknowledgments. And the first one is to Grace Dillon, uh, Anishinaabe scholar who coined the term Indigenous Futurism in her book, Walking the Clouds, uh, and is active in the space and someone um, we're all really aware of her important work in this area. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we are currently in Black History Month and that uh, there's a deep relationship between Indigenous futurism and uh, Afrofuturism based on Black resistances and uh, shared colonial histories in many senses. So this is an area I am still learning about, um, but uh, I think uh, we should leave it open today for questions or discussion on that. And uh, we're all in a learning path in terms of kind of intersectionality and shared struggles and uh, visions of the future. So I uh, wanted to acknowledge that. And I also wanted to say that uh, this conversation, as you can already tell, uh, will not probably be super conventional. Uh, looking at it as something that is somewhat co-created, I may answer questions, other people may ask questions. We won't necessarily stick to the whole moderator um, panelist format. And as well, uh, it won't necessarily be a linear conversation. And uh, I want to frame the conversation as a, a type of collage, uh, provocation, uh, to leave open all the possibilities of directions that we can move in. And I also wanted to um, reference um, something that I, um, a form of dialogue that I heard about from Blackfoot elder Leroy Little Bear uh, and saw in action several times, have been really lucky to witness. And uh, it's really inspired my um, idea of how we dialogue together. Uh, and he, uh, I won't get this perfect, but I will give a couple of uh, pointers about how he frames dialogue. And one of them is uh, that uh, real dialogue has no uh, goal or end point or destination. That in choosing a destination, you cut off the possibilities of the exploration. And so it's really important that we don't need to get anywhere today. We're just gonna be talking. Um, and what's really important uh, in, in um, you know, genuine dialogue is the idea of uh, listening very openly, which he states as putting aside our tacit mental infrastructures which is basically uh, some of our ideas and beliefs to be able to open ourselves to listen and be present to what's being shared. We can always uh, throw it out at the end of this hour and a half and go back to everything the way it was, but uh, maybe for this next little while, we can uh, all agree to uh, try to put down those uh, beliefs and just uh, hear something. Um, on its own terms. So uh, that is my introduction. And um, I'm going to launch in. Uh, oh, actually, I forgot. I believe that potentially there may be some responses uh, to this concept of dialogue. So I just want to ask if the panelists have uh, anything they want to respond to in that. I think that was potentially you, Karen, but I'm going to put you on the spot. I can continue. 
no pressure. Yeah. Um, Dave, do you want to go first and then I'll follow you? Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking in our, we were chatting beforehand and thinking about what uh, Indigenous Futurism makes possible. And I think that's a question that's going to come up soon. But I think one of the things we were chatting about beforehand is that um, it is um, not just about Indigenous Futurism, as we were talking about them, isn't just about content, but it's also about formal intervention. So the ways uh, the ways in which Indigenous Futurism allow us to think differently or to imagine otherwise, um, as Daniel puts it. And I think that there is that space for, uh, there needs to be that space for non-linear um, uh, installations, as Karen Reckley puts it in her work, um, that, we, that we think in these different kinds of relationships. Uh, and I think um, we're so steeped or we are so marinated in partic particular mental infrastructures um, that it's often difficult to see the way out. So part of what I love about uh, Indigenous futurism, Afrofuturism, is that it gives us these other ways of thinking. Um, it gives us pathways um, to think differently. Yeah, and I was thinking in relation to that, thinking through like what are some of the strategies of like care that folks articulate in um, their their activating of the futures in the now, um, but also like what are some of the unexpected detours or um, ways of remapping that uh, folks who are interested and who are writing, for example, um, speculative fiction. Um, I'm really a big fan of um, N.K. Jemison's work um, on the Broken Earth series and thinking through um, some of the, the ways in which we fall into relation with um, the ground and with soil and rock and our more than human kin relations and thinking through the different kinds of pathways, the different kinds of furtive gestures um, that are possible when we consider um, the legacies and the ongoingness of Black radical traditions and Afrofuturist thoughts in relationship with um, some of the work that's being done, for example, your work, Lisa Jackson, in thinking through what the possibilities are when we start to look at the atmospherics, when we start to look at subaqueous, um, subterranean um, pathways and, and furtive gestures that bring us into different kinds of relation with each other and um, allow us to ask different kinds of questions. I'll just uh, throw that out there because I think we're gonna return later to perhaps um, some of the more nuanced uh, gestures that we can kind of think through and think alongside. And being open to, as you put it in your work, Karen, is, uh, to falling into these relationships, which doesn't, which means that we don't know where we're going to land or if we're going to land, right? And I think that, so that, that resonates with um, uh, Leroy Little Bear's work in really, really neat ways. Yeah, and so uh, not if uh, maybe I'll jump in. I, I can tell this conversation is just going to go, which is awesome. Um, I am going to read uh, a couple of quotes, and then I'll follow with a question. These are quotes that um, David provided. I think they're really nice uh, framing um things to think on uh context especially for those who uh, are new to the ideas of uh indigenous futurism and uh speculative fictions so uh the first one is uh by samuel delaney and it's science fiction isn't just thinking about the world out there it's also thinking about the world how the world might be a particularly important exercise for those who are oppressed because if we're going to change the world we live in they and all of us have to be able to think about a world that works differently. And I think that's a really interesting uh, framing, a world that works differently, the ability to imagine otherwise, as David pointed out that Daniel Heath Justice has talked about. Um, Lou Cornum says, Indigenous futurism is centered on bringing traditions to distant future locations rather than abandoning them as relics. Indigenous futurism does not care for speed so much as sustainability, not so much for progress as balance, and not power, but relation. And finally, uh, Wab Rice says, a lot of post-apocalyptic stories are about despair and anguish with the most desperate scenarios. I wanted to offer up the perspective of people who had experienced apocalypse already. So moving from that, um, perhaps, um, 
an interesting place to start is to talk about the meanings of, uh, I might jump around you guys. I know you have questions, but I tend to shift. But I think starting with apocalypse or apocalypses is, is a good place to begin. Um, um, I would love to hear from you guys. Uh, what are the meanings of apocalypse that you can, that you engage with uh, in your thinking and your work? And why is it important who defines the word? And why is it important that there's a plurality of apocalypses, uh, which I've heard made mention of? Um, and I wanted to mention Dallas. Um, I, I noted uh, the, uh, the term totem transfer narratives in your work, uh, which I hadn't heard before. And I thought that was a really interesting part of this conversation. So I'll just uh, open it up uh, if anyone wants to speak to the idea of apocalypse, apocalypses, and um, you know, definitions, both settler and indigenous. Yeah, I think uh, the notion of apocalypse is, is, is an, an interesting sort of term. I mean, I think, I think it, Kim Tallbear, who says we're already a sort of post-apocalyptic people, given the uh, numerous violences visited upon indigenous communities and nations and and, and peoples and all of those things. But we also have can otherware that have also faced things like apocalypse. And I don't mean apocalypse in the sense of uh, uh, the, the complete eradication of peoples, but rather the sort of intentional, in this sense, I guess, sort of uh, destruction of particular life worlds, right? Of trying to eradicate the ways in which uh, in this instance, indigenous peoples, uh, the ways in which we relate with one another and trying to really just uh, sever those sort of um, those, those sort of kinship or, uh, or relational qualities and things like that. So I think, um, so I think apocalypse works in multiple different registers and in relation to multiple different communities. Um, and, uh, and just because these quote unquote apocalypses have been attempted doesn't mean that they were successful, right? And in fact, it's, it's precisely because they were not that um, I think that's why we sort of envision the future and why we project into the future. And, and I liked what Karen said about the future and the now because um, I do think that we don't always have to position uh, our sort of political or communal goals in to project them always into the future because I think that might it, sometimes that's a deferral that doesn't allow people to enact good relations in the present right and so um, yeah that's just sort of me thinking through apocalypse just to very briefly talk about the totem transfer thing I th that's just something I'm sort of interested in and in terms of settler replacement narratives wherein um, Settler replacement narratives will take the knowledges of indigenous peoples and uh, but then they'll expel those particular peoples from the future. So there's a way in which um, uh, uh, apocalypse or, you know, just the notion of elimination can take place through a variety of different mechanisms and one of which is just really the stealing of indigenous knowledges to uh, for settlers to you know, quote unquote, solves the ills that they have created, if that makes sense. So yeah, I'll just mute myself now. I, I mean, I'm inspired by Dallas's work on this, this question, quite frankly, and, and what he's done with the Mad Max films and thinking about totem transfer narratives and the ways in which we have this very whitewashed uh, version of the apocalypse that um, I think you even mentioned and one of the, the docs we're sharing, Lisa, the, you know, the, the cli-fi um, narrative, where which we have this very, this, this white notion of what the apocalypse looks like. Um, and I think part of the work that I've done looking at Cherie Dimeline's um, books, uh, or particularly the Marrow Thieves, is, is to speak to that totem transfer narrative, the ways in which um, uh, whiteness works to subsume uh, indigeneity in order to sustain itself during the apocalypse. Um, so it becomes a method of extraction. Um, uh, uh, so, so whiteness as fueling the apocalypse. Um, so I think that there's in a couple of ways, there's one hand how 
in mainstream or white stream narratives, we have this very narrow definition of what the apocalypse can be, and it is always future oriented, and it does not acknowledge uh, uh, the ongoing apocalypses um, that we see around us. Um, but then I think there's also, um, I'm losing my train of thought a little bit. But we also have um, apocalypses that are, are particularly about how whiteness draws um, from or feeds off of indigeneity um, in order to stave off the apocalypse. Um, so that, that how, how indigenous folks get caught up in all sorts of different ways uh, in those narratives are hyper visibilized and invisibilized um, often at the same time. And I was also um, I was also just thinking about how apocalyptic narratives really um, devalue and don't highlight the processes of care and mutual aid and support that communities are practicing in these particular moments in time. Like I'm thinking through the kinds of socialities that we bring forward into the future that have been always activated through like community organizing. That's been um, those, those, uh, or those forms of gathering have been kind of like treated like hidden geographies, right? Like they're kind of erased from the, the narrative. And so for me, I think what I'm interested in is looking at those gatherings, those gatherings for, you know, thinking through treaty gatherings, for example, as like speculative futurity work, you know, um, thinking about the kinds of forms of gathering and the kinds of telling and the kinds of geographies and relationalities and ways to make kin that have been shared through generations of people you know, and also when I think about apocalyptic, and I, I don't actually think about apocalypse a lot to tell you the truth, I think that we've actually been kind of like born into rupture, like in so much that it's almost like that's our reality, right? Like, and when I think about celestials and stars, you know, Buffy St. Marie once had this conversation with me that was like stars are exploding all the time in space like nebulas, right? Like there's these mass explosions that are happening celestially. And like, it makes sense that, you know, we were born into rupture and that um, we process or we, um, we, we, we move um, in ways that are oriented towards um, accommodating rupture, but also like, thinking about jumping scale from it at the same time. So I think that's why we have always kind of looked to these patterns, these stars, these different kinds of formations and gatherings. Um, so I, I guess all that to say is that I associate sort of apocalyptical spaces as spaces of gathering mutual aid and care where people like really talk about what are our survival strategies and you know, how do we be in relation with this community or like what are the forms of welcoming others into um, gatherings and, and co-constituting gatherings across multiple communities? Fascinating. Um, I'm, this is not on my list, but I'm curious if anyone has, one of the things I think is interesting is, you know, this idea of rupture or apocalypse or change and possibility. And it seems to me that in uh, the mainstream narratives, uh, there's a real dualism, right? That destruction equals everything goes away and it's wrong. Uh, whereas rupture indicates a, a generative kind of state and possibility. So I'm curious if any of you have uh, thoughts about uh, indigenous futurism and the relationship to rupture and possibility, um, does that spark anything? Uh, I guess, gonna... oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, okay. No, I was just gonna say the two words that ends the Merothees, right? The Merothees is a dystopic novel that ends with the two words, anything, everything. Um, so uh, that, that possibility in those words. Dallas, did you want to add to that? 
Uh, uh, Karen, do you want to go first? Oh, well, sure. Yeah, I feel like we're playing Jeopardy. I'm like, doop, doop, doop. <laughs> Um, yes. And I thank you, Dallas. I was also thinking about like this um, meteor, this, this sacred rock, Buffalo child stone in Saskatchewan that was um, blown up uh, in order to create sort of like this um, human made lake, Lake Diefenbaker. And part of that sacred ancestor, that sacred kin still lives at the bottom of that, um, of that water. And I was thinking about like how that meteor, how that, that more than human kinship has been sort of exploded into space in all these kind of different directions. So um, I think about the tracings and trailings of meteors as sort of like the ways in which we land um, sometimes, especially in urban spaces and cities, you know, especially when we think about dislocation, such as, you know, the 60 scoop um, residential schools, like, I'm really kind of thinking through like landing practices and how we land into sets of relationships. Um, and I think that, you know, rupture is a part of that, too. I think that rupture, when we think about rupture, it can be, it can be a generative conversation, you know, to talk about um, processes of like what happens in the body during the fall, you know, like the pressure and the, the tension, um, what happens, how do we embody rupture, and then kind of thinking through together, how do we experience these ruptures, and what can be the future forms of co-constituting um, spaces to land as we fall into these relationships. Yeah, and I think too, just to sort of, um, just to pick up where uh, Karen was talking, and this might not be completely uh, uh, on, uh, on the same line, but I'm just thinking about these notions of destruction and rupture and how, and actually still holding on to this notion of apocalypse, uh, which I know is a term we're all sort of uncomfortable with in, in a variety of ways, but um, I do wonder if there's a sort of generative way in which we can deploy the term apocalypse, just in terms of um, uh, in terms of thinking about the current sort of configurations that structure our lives. So, um, what do we think about the apocalypse, quote unquote, of uh, settler colonialism? Right, like what would that then enable? And uh, um, I also think, and that doesn't mean the, uh, uh, I'm not talking about the, uh, the violence done to particular communities or peoples, but rather a whole sort of structural system that sort of uh, navigates the way in which we relate to one another, right? And so um, if that system were to crumble, then how might we relate differently? And I think that uh, when uh, Karen brought up treaty, uh, I was very interested in that as a sort of idea because, you know, how do we think about treaty, uh, you know, with the destruction or rupture or whatever term you want to use, apocalypse of something like settler colonialism. So should that system fail or fall, uh, how might we enact treaty relations in a good way? Right? How might we then start to relate to one another? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting things to think through here. Yeah, I also think about this uh, concept like architecture otherwise, like what other kinds of architectures of being together and of like hosting each other and thinking about how we be in good relation. Um, what are these sort of architectures otherwise? And I like I feel like Sean Crawley's work on around otherwise and otherwise movements is really key to thinking through some of these strategies. So like, what are the vocabularies? What are the concepts? What are the practices or gestures um, that contribute to placemaking and space making projects? Um, and I'm thinking through like poetics, you know, like I'm thinking through spoken words, speculative fiction, like the ways in which, um, these vocabularies allow us to co-imagine and co-constitute and organize together um, in order to um, 
think about how we co-relationally make spaces um, that are, um, you know, focused towards Black liberation and focused towards um, Indigenous, like, in, focused towards decolonization. And I think when we talk about the possibility of apocalyptic languaging practices, maybe that's therein the, the possibility of, you know, thinking through, we, we explode this, um, this, this particular architecture, and then we, we provide uh, a new, like a different kind of vision of architecture otherwise. I, I wanted to say, Lisa, I think that you, have something to bring to this conversation, particularly through transmissions and, and the Dobbin. So I would love to hear what, what you have to say on. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, well, this is, I won't take up too much time. I've done two projects called Bedavid and Transmissions. I call them sister projects. Uh, they they kind of grew from the same soil as it were. Um, and the inspiration, I mean, they imagine a future uh, that, is not post-apocalyptic, but there's no current term that I have to speak of it. Uh, a, uh, a future space where the current societal structures are no longer active, uh, which for many looks like decay, but it is also a space that is uh, in a regenerative um, phase uh, where the kind of more than human forms uh, are in resurgence and uh, specifically where indigenous languages are in resurgence. And, um, you know, Badabin is a VR project. And so you put a headset on and uh, you can move around and uh, explore uh, the, it's downtown Toronto in that case. Um, and around you are, uh, you hear the languages of um, Tukaranto, the three uh, traditional indigenous languages. And I, and I won't get into the whole thing, but, um, you can look it up on my website, uh, but the idea here to me was just, I think, uh, and I can go on for a bit, I'm, I'm a non-speaker of uh, my mother's mother tongue, uh, Anishinaabe Moen, um, but she was a speaker before residential school, and for me, I think I've located, you know, the sense of loss, uh, rupture, and possibility uh, within language and to large extent, because uh, for me, reading about the languages, almost like an excavation, became this wild discovery of totally different modes of being in the world. And, um, and they're embedded in, say, a language that's full of verbs instead of nouns, meaning uh, action and therefore uh, process and relationship above objects uh, is one example. And I'm, I'm generalizing now, but many indigenous languages share strong traits that are very different from European languages. Um, and so in these concepts, which I won't uh, outline too much, I saw possibilities for relationship and um, process and a kind of almost, uh, it's almost like quantum theory. Like there's actually a story uh, that um, in fact, back to Leroy Little Bear, uh, met with a quantum physicist, uh, David Bohm, who had uh, speculated uh, a made up language called the Rio mode, which uh, uh, would fit with reality as he knew it as a quantum physicist. And so this was not a real language, but it had a number of qualities that he was fascinated by. And then I can't remember if it was Leroy that he met or a Mohawk language speaker, but he said, you're speaking the Rio mode. Your language is the Rio mode that I imagined. And, you know, the language, the things that, uh, that uh, marked the Rio mode or these was flux, the idea of flux and process and transformation and relationships and motion and stillness and stillness in motion and all of these concepts. Uh, which uh, in many cases, uh, North American indigenous languages can capture and English cannot. And so for me, there is uh, immense possibility in imagining a speculative future where the languages grew again. And in considering the languages as um, I said this yesterday in the panel, like a kind of a, 
uh, a continuum where these thought, the languages exist and those are our ancestors, you know, and in many ways, because languages are connected to place, they grow in a place and they describe that place very specifically. Uh, they are an inheritance and they can even be said to be the way the land speaks through us, right? What if we are agents of uh, the land speaking itself through uh, humans. And so that was some of the ideas I was playing around with in transmissions and um, Bedauben. And I think similar to Karen, I'm really fascinated by the poetics, the metaphors. And I don't even think metaphor is the right term because it's too separated. But the, the way of relating to um, sturgeon, stars, rocks, dirt, sky and uh, you know, more than human kin is what we say, but it's really beyond that into the atmospherics that I hear Karen talk about. Um, and, um, and so we, we sort of start to embody relationships beyond or interrogate what those could look like. So all of that for me speaks to uh, possibilities of different concepts or renewed concepts of kinship. Um, so I will leave it there, but I, I did have a question. Anyone can respond in any way they want. Um, I think that different concepts of time and place are within our ancestral languages and cultures. And notably, I wanna say to what is, you know, the mainstream that exists is that the enlightenment thinking really privileges this linear sense of time where through human rational, intellect, we can, the knowledges we accumulate, um, like capitalism, come together and build and build until we get to some supposedly perfect future, where we have sort of uh, collected all the knowledge and, and understand everything, which is a deeply different uh, basis for understanding than understanding that humans are the most fragile, the most dependent, and the most in need of caring for everything that sustains us. So those are the kind of big overarching things. And, and I won't speak too much more after this, but I was curious about the idea of science fiction, apocalyptic narratives, and indigenous futurism. How do they cast the world, the natural world as a character? What does kinship mean in these contexts? Human, more than human, atmospheric and even technological. And here I'm thinking about Jason Lewis and, and the sort of provocative uh, statement that uh, what if machines are our kin? What if, uh, what if AI, what if we welcome AI into the circle of kinship and relationships? So I'll open that up for whoever wants to speak. Maybe Dallas, go ahead. No, Sorry. no, Karen, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> maybe kinship is like, and, and this is just a thought moment, thought experiment, but maybe kinship is like, are these sort of like movements? Like maybe kinship are built as a series of gestures of leaning into another's atmospheric. And maybe, you know, this thinking through with your work about like the, the, the dirt, the soil, alongside Alexis Pauline Gum's work of the dirt in the archive of dirt in the M archive. I'm thinking maybe, maybe the, um, the movements that happen underneath, in the, in the underneath, are those um, that this, this uh, I guess the transmissions. Um, are the, are the gestures of kinship making with, and then I think about the relationship that we have to terminology and con, uh, the conceptualization of more than human and other than human. I'm still, I, I'm still kind of figuring out what that, how that feels for me, because I use those terms a lot, but then I also think about what does it mean when black and brown people have not been granted full humanity, you know, how can we use this language oh, like in terms of thinking through kinship um, without really talking about these, you know, thinking about liberation in a way that, you know, that embodies like a critique of settler colonialism and anti-Blackness and also 
what is the relationship between that critique and the kinds of, um, of, of gatherings or of um, landings that we imagine for the future. Still figuring things out, but I'll just uh, leave that there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I might just speak solely to the language component of this, which is just, I, I really appreciate you foregrounding, Lisa, how our languages are sort of evolving and especially in resurgence efforts, they they start to take on new characteristics to sort of describe the current and future worlds that we might inhabit, right? That our, our, our languages are not static and they're not dying, which is something that's constantly sort of projected on us and just uh, in, a, in a Cree way and not to romanticize the Cree language in any particular way because, you know, um, I don't want to do that with any language really, but, um, you know, we have different ways of, of just thinking about how we relate to things in the world. So for example, we don't, I don't know, uh, things aren't gendered, right? In Cree, we're, we're really talking about animate, non-animate objects. And that actually has, I think, I think it carries a deep impact about how we start to configure and think about the world is what are we, uh, what's animate and what are we in relation to? And if something's uh, inanimate, let's say, or non-animate, uh, why is that the case? And how do we sort of configure that? So I think the language itself can sort of, um, can sort of ground us in a way that sort of uh, allows us to take a, a sort of relational overview as to how we're uh, interacting in the world generally. And I think, uh, I do think our languages are going to be sort of projected into the future. And I, I do think they have the capability or possibility to actually get us to sort of think about things otherwise in, in, in numerous different ways. So, yeah. And sometimes I, I have concerns about the categorization, categorization of speculative fiction too, in the way that it's applied to indigenous literatures uh, in ways that sort of, that take away from the reality um, of the reality of what is going on in reference to the apocalypse, for instance. Um, so, I mean, I was reading last night a beautiful story from this collection, um, a Love After the End. Um, there's a, Jay Simpson has a great story in here called um, The Ark of the Turtle's Back, uh, and they're on their way to a new planet. Earth has died. They're on their way to a new planet. Uh, and the main character asks, how do we build a relationship with this new planet? Uh, and um, the the person responds, I would assume like all consensual relationships, we ask them out. Um, so that made me, I mean, made me think about this relationship to land and how land is positioned, as you said, Lisa, in, in Indigenous speculative fiction, but also these gestures of consent uh, and relationship with land um, and earth, um, which I think also comes across in non-speculative ways that we also need to draw into these conversations. Um, so I think of uh, Jeanette Armstrong's work with land speaking uh, and the, the ways in which she's talking specifically to the ways her language comes from the land, right? That there is, she's talking about a consensual relationship. She has what Silic's territory that gives her um, access to the land. And I think those kinds of relationships um, from a, a sort of a Western sci-fi perspective get folded into the speculative in ways that I think are dangerous. Um, uh, and misguided. Um, so I think part of these conversations too are, are we thinking about what indigenous futurisms need to mean much differently in, in alongside or against um, um, Western speculative fiction. I like this. Um, I really appreciate this thread about like thinking about consent. Um, so like how, do, when you develop patterns of relationality um, in coding, for example, like thinking about Jason Lewis's work and AI and like it, that refuses sort of like, that refuses violence. Um, it requires sort of this ongoing consensual process and commitment to human and more than human relations where, you know, when we think about um, the ask, so falling into relation is actually a call 
waiting for a response with the full, like fully thinking that um, to move within a specific territory or place is an act of, of humility in the instance where we have to be open to hearing the word no, <laughs> right? And that's not something that we're quite comfortable thinking about and thinking through. Um, just this, these ongoing, these ongoing commitments to consensual um, relations, I think, is so important in, you know, thinking about the future of uh, otherwise possibilities that are going to work for us, that, you know, that don't claim bodies as their own, as possessions, that um, are thinking about the nuanced ways to be in relation, you know, if we were to take extraction off the table completely, um, what are those gestures of reaching out and of consent? Um, and I'm really interested in what are those languages and concepts that um, are challenging, you know, us in our movement practices as we move together or as we we have desires to move consensually and to, to be open to hearing the word no. That's not okay. Yeah, I, I think too that there's a tendency, especially uh, through the language of like kinship or relationality, where that there's this sort of very um, sort of um, streamlined or very simple way in which everyone sort of gets along. And there are sort of particular rhetorics, you know, like reconciliation, not to bring that term up because I don't want to talk about that <laughs> in a extended way, um, but uh, these ways in which there are these uh, sort of imposed sorts of um, narratives that make us think that these sort of processes are going to be easy or they're going to be, um, that they're not going to be messy and rather, you know, as Karen's saying, there are so many other things to sort of consider in the process of kinship or relating in a good way, uh, one of which is consent and, and, and also the idea that these relationships will not always be easy, though they might be messy long into the future, right? And so, um, and it's really just about how you navigate that sort of messiness that I think is sort of important. Yeah, and we have to develop like really quick shifts in ground tactics, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, as we navigate the messiness, you know, it's like, okay, you know, like we just, you know, you, like, you know, I think about um, all of the, like the precision in a lot of like visual artists work and also sonic like layering of futures, you know, in poetics, there's this precision about detail and about like, I'm thinking about tattoos as well lately, you know, thinking about skin glyphs as sort of these um, futuristic devices that are precise, that lines are really thought through, that images, that um, sigils are really con deeply considered in terms of like showing indigenous movement, you know, like when, when a line changes, when a curve happens, when a detour happens, it's like we have to be open to all of these kinds of possibilities. When we are told no, okay, I'm gonna sit with this and I'm gonna go this way, you know, like we have to be so open to negotiating each other's space. Um, and each other's imaginings of the future. And I think, you know, thinking about settler colonial narratives of the future, there's this urge to kind of push yourself and insert yourself without being invited into the future. <laughs> so what are the gentle ways of leaning into each other, of being with each other, um, being with our more than human relations that aren't so pushing yourself into this space that you, you haven't spent the time thinking about, you know, how is that gentle future? What is what are those gentle futurity gestures? I guess. I'm curious. Just I will say this in case it makes sense. I don't want to. Um, I'm curious about the idea of futurity bundles that you've talked about, Karen. Uh, maybe it's now. Maybe it's later. Maybe it's not today. But. There's a way I'm intrigued by uh, when I've heard you talk about that, um, 
that feels like this interesting, and I could be wrong on this, but this bridge, like what we're talking about uh, in so many ways too, is this idea of, you know, futurity in and of itself posits a kind of speculative, but we are in a political and we are in real relationships with power structures. And, you know, what's interesting, I think about this conversation as way, the way the poetics and the political is co existing and uh, there's a, a refusal, <laughs> you know, to accept uh, those separations or that romanticization that, and I, I can say as a creator myself, one of the things that I think, um, I've never really quite articulated it, but there is, I refuse to let go of the possibility and the beauty and the poetry uh, as a reality. And I also refuse to let go of, you know, the political damage and the hurt and the, you know, the sort of more boots on the ground thing. They are not inextricable and we don't graduate from one to the other, um, that they remain both really active. And it's difficult, I think, sometimes to find the, um, to have those things coexist because mainstream or settler culture that's the binary, especially that indigenous and any um, racialized people are put into is, you know, the fantasy and then, you know, the sort of uh, demonized part. And so I don't know if it's, but I mean, when I think about when you, and I don't fully understand futurity bundles, but the sense that they're, the, the bundle kind of does this thing with our ancestors or something that's come from the past that's been left for us that is also there for us in the future. And I think that it means something about, you know, a kind of going through into a troubled landscape that we have to navigate and change tactics and that there's some guidance there. So I'm just kind of um, curious about that. And I think in general, it's, it's any reflections on maintaining these two, uh, what would be considered poles, uh, like poetics and politics, which I don't think they are. And how does that inform conversations about indigenous futurism or change? Gorgeous, my gosh, you're so brilliant. I just love the way that you think. You know, I was we, we've had ongoing conversations about orbs and about um, lights and about like, orbs as I'm thinking through almost like like futurity bundles hanging from celestial like from trees and from sky and from like almost like with Wilfred Buck's work you know thinking through the spider and the thread of the spider webs and these orbs that are attached to it that are these beings of light that are our future ancestors that you know um that are falling, that are feeling the pressure of the atmospheric, that are all of these things. And, you know, I think about like futurity bundles as originally I was thinking about them in a long, alongside with my daughter, you know, thinking through at a time when I was like afraid. I was, uh, I was, I be just freshly became a single mom and I was terrified. And, um, you know, I was thinking about, I need to be a water carrier and a, a fire keeper and I need to be these things. And I was thinking about my daughter and I was thinking about like, how are we gonna do this? I mean, I just had sort of a threat to my safety at that time and I was really nervous and scared. And um, I remember one night I was sitting with the moon <laughs> in my little tiny place in Toronto, and I saw my two sister stars that were up there, all the stars that I could see with all the city light, right? And that's when I thought about constellation and constellatory relations. And, and how I needed them at that time to know that I could raise this beautiful star being and that I could keep her safe and I could keep us safe. So I began to think through futurity bundles as, as bundles of futurity that I would map out, that I would go out there and I would, in the darkness, and I would hang these bundles so that Gracie, my daughter, when she needed to, when, when children needed to travel by night, to the north, to the water, that they would have these bundles, these survival toolkits, that they would have these bundles that they could know that they were loved and that the, these movements are written in the stars. There would be a star map, there would be a knife, 
there would be, you know, um, mace, they were, there would be um, all of a love letter from me or from, you know, a future ancestor, you know, that they would have these bundles at night when they needed to travel um, with each other. I'm going to get lost in that because I just remember that feeling in that moment in time that, you know, that's what helped me get through that really scary time, really. Um, that's all I have to say about that right now. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I could be more. Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. I think that was a beautiful demonstration of, you know, these things are not separate. And uh, just a really um, it's super inspiring. And it grounds, I think it grounds the conversation what you just shared with us as well. Um, and extends it. So thank you for, for that. Um, uh, I feel like I heard a part of that before, but I hadn't heard it in its entirety. And it's just so, um, I think it's really beautiful. And I want to, if we want to go here, I feel like this could go in a few different directions. So I want to open it up there. There was basically um, another area that I don't feel is central, but I'll just raise it and we can talk about that or we can go in a different direction if we want. Um, but I, you know, I've been doing some working with uh, stars and uh, sky world uh, in my current work, uh, including increasingly meteorites. Uh, so we won't go down the rabbit hole, Karen and I on the meteorites thing, but oh my gosh, they are incredible. Um, uh, but I am interested more generally speaking in space because when we talk about futures or possibilities or the imagination of where humans can go, like uh, space uh, has always been there um, so often in creation stories that we have. Um, the idea that the stars are our ancestors, our relatives is very common in many of our cultures. Um, but of course, it's also been a part, and of course, it's also been a part of um, you know, the final frontier of space exploration. And I'm aware right now that, you know, with Elon Musk and SpaceX and asteroid mining and, um, you know, Rover just landed on Mars um, and all of this, there's such uh, space is the reality of what is happening in space, but space is also deeply tied to our imaginations and our projections of future, right? It's really linked. And um, uh, I'm just curious to know your folks thought about, you know, here we are in climate crisis and we're talking, we hear about terraforming and moving to other planets. Uh, we hear, there's always a sense of possibility for traveling into space, but there's also been a kind of traveling or uh, relationship with space in many of our um, origin stories and our cultural stories. So um, I wonder if uh, anyone feels like discussing the role of cosmos, um, where indigenous futurism potentially can interrupt the, you know, the settler colonial capitalist uh, space exploration narrative. I just think it's kind of a rich area to talk about. Thank you, Lisa. Um, it's a it's a big question, I'll, and I, 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 one way I'll try and talk about it um, is maybe the examples that we have in cyberspace. Um, so Loretta Todd has talked really beautifully and really presciently back in the late nine. Uh, late 90s um, about the ways in which um, these settler narratives of colonialism were being translated into cyberspace. Um, so cyberspace as a place to escape. Um, so by creating this digital space, spaces like William Gibson was, was imagining, for instance, um, Neil Stevenson, um, that these were spaces that uh, we could then dismiss the damage we were doing to the earth because we, and I say we as white people, were creating this other space that, that we could go to. So it was a way of deferring the damage that was occurring. Uh, and that led to, and Todd said that's built into the Western ep epistem. She, she traced it back to Plato and the allegory of the cave, right? <laughs> like that, that, that is part of how the West understands escapism. Uh, and, and she, at that point, um, was, you know, 
begged caution. Like, what does this mean for indigenous stories in this space? And I think she was really trepidatious and rightfully so. And I think has used that map to go on to do um, amazing stuff in VR that she continues to do right right now. But I think there are lessons in in cyberspace and the ways in which we think colonialism and gestures of consent and ways of being that have been mapped out by folks like Loretta Todd, by Scawinati, um, by Jason Lewis, um, by newer voices like Mays Longboat, um, who are negotiating these spaces with care um, and gentleness um, and thinking about it not as this Elon Musk-like phallic intervention, um, but as, as kinds of relationality and tracing out, finding new ways to trace out the edges um, of the relationships we find in these spaces. So I'm, as a new media scholar, that's as close to space as I can get. But I think that there are, I think that there are coded ways to think about those kind of explorations in there. Karen? Yeah, I was also kind of thinking through, um, like, again, drawing upon Wilfred Buck's teachings, um, you know, thinking about the star blanket, uh, the Pleiades constellation, and thinking through how, you know, when I, I think through star, the star blanket constellation as sort of like this, this portal space. Um, and I'm careful here because I, I want to make sure that I, uh, that I, I get this right. Um, but I'm thinking through the, the, the star blankets that folks are tending to and are careful about stitching and the, the edges of the star blankets, um, the, the call and response of a star blanket. I'm thinking about the, the feel of a star blanket and the star blanket as a landing glyph, you know, in kind of mimicking the, the celestial and the terrestrial and acknowledging the space of possibility that we're in, kind of like Bidabin thinking, I'm thinking like almost like a different layering of time, a different spatial, temporal, um, glitch space that we can kind of fold ourselves into in the nature of a star blanket. And um, for me, you know, when I first went home to Sturgeon Lake, I was 16. And that's where I'm originally from is Sturgeon Lake. And the first thing that I was gifted was a star blanket. And so I folded myself into that blanket. And ever since then, I've been really kind of like thinking about star blankets as landing glyphs, as ways to land as like, you know, the star blanket in the sky and also the star blankets below. So I'm still kind of thinking through um, the star blanket as a landing glyph or a landing, um, maybe it, I don't think it's glyph anymore. I think it's something else. Um, yeah. So taking, I guess, those images and, and embodying those images and embodying an intimacy with those images is something that's really meaningful for me and the thinking and the work that I do. Yeah, and I think too that we, um, uh, just to echo what Lisa was saying, um, you know, those are our relatives. And uh, I think we need to make particular assertions or, um, you know, uh, uh, I think in, in, in many ways we have to think about protecting our relatives in that way. And, you know, you see that with the Kanaka Maui and sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, asserting particular, uh, making assertions so that giant telescopes don't not only decimate their um, lands there, like here in, you know, Earth, but also um, I think just sort of the sort of um, extractive sort of notion of just looking into the stars and seeing sort of what our our relatives are doing. There's this kind of terrible movie. I don't know. I don't know if it's terrible. I, I don't know what my opinions are about it, but it's I think it's called Ad Astra. It's that James Gray movie with Brad Pitt or whatever. And the part about it that like made the most sense to me was that um, 
as soon as they got to the moon, I think it was, they immediately, it was sort of like, it's, there's like a shopping mall there. It's like a, it's a it's, so you immediately see this projection into the future and into space, outer space of, of a sort of capitalistic sort of like constantly sort of annexing sort of mindset, right? And it's, it's funny to me that even in mainstream, uh, you know, settler films that you actually i know this is a critique of it um in a in a way through that film but it it is interesting to see that that's actually projected into the future and into space that it's not about being in relation with the stars and with you know all of these other things but rather that you know capitalism and settler colonial capitalism will endure like in in into the and so I think that what indigenous futurist thinkers and writers and filmmakers and all and, and all these peoples are doing is sort of, you know, trying to project a sort of otherwise, uh, a sort of different way of relating to our sort of celestial kin, because um, if we don't, I don't think things are going to be very, I think we need to do that. Yeah. Uh, Ed Astor was a terrible film, Dallas. I <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I was <laughs> I wasn't alone. Okay, but I also I also made me think of another film with Gravity, that Sandra Bullock, uh, uh, George Clooney one that has this remarkable and, and perplexing moment in it when Sandra Bullock is free floating in space. George Clooney's trying to rescue her, and then there's this space phone call made to an Inuit man back on Earth. Uh, and there, so there's this moment where, again, the settler colonial moment where, uh, and I think it's a totem transfer narrative in a lot of ways, where the, the, these white space explorers need to be saved um, by uh, indigenous people. They need to be grounded by indigenous people in order for that colonial mission to succeed. Um, it, it's just, it's so baked in um, to, to these, to the ways that, that settlers imagine space travel, right? It's not just these capitalist projections, but also how they'll, they can maintain connection to the earth. And the only way they need to, they know how to do that is, is through this extractive relationship to in, uh, indigenous people, right? It's just, um, yeah, it's a bizarre moment in that film. I, I never, I've watched it a few times and I don't know what to do with it, but Ed Astor made me think of it too. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's this idea that uh, indigenous people are going to save uh, settlers when the quote unquote apocalypse or all this stuff sort of comes. And I'm just sort of like, have we not taken stock of the last couple centuries? <laughs> like, I don't know. Uh, it, yeah. Anyway, indigenous peoples are smart. We're, I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything here. I'm just, I, I, I think these fantasies are, are really quite interesting in terms of what they sort of illustrate right and 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 they not only project into the future but they actually call back to the past in many ways right in terms of you know early settlement and all these things and people so yeah and uh i'll just add that i think even i think one of the most exciting uh conversations is that just about time itself you know and constructs of time uh so the whole idea of futurism is um a constructed concept right so i uh i was saying yesterday which is one of my well you know i have one more question for you guys and i'll just set it up and ask you and and we'll go to the q it'll give me a moment to take a look at our q a uh questions here but uh uh i find uh messing with time you know bedab in my vr piece in a lot of ways was uh you know the sense was that through these voices well you know i was thinking a lot about cycles you know the very notion of time is cyclical interrupts the linear kind of mainstream model uh for one thing right so i find myself attracted to uh the moon and cycles um of water movement uh, even day and night and of course seasons. And those were all kind of um, in evidence in Badabin, uh, but as well, this idea of sound. And I don't know why I located in sound, but to me, sound is such a physical, like as an artist, uh, visuals feel um, similarly um, like uh, 
rapacious. Like you, you can, you can have images go faster and faster and you kind of take the images with your eyes, whereas sound is by its nature physical, it resonates, it actually moves things and you cannot manipulate it in the same way that you can imagery uh, or it loses its kind of cohesiveness. So there's a way in which I, uh, I kind of locate place and space. I, 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 you know, from an artist's perspective, I identify that with sound. And then when we add the language in, there's a way in which I feel like sound or language is time travel or it does interrupt that narrative of like past to future. And I find hope in that. And then I also wanna say, uh, cause the question is, you know, uh, not that we need to be hopeful. I also think that's annoying. We need to be resilient. We need to be hopeful <laughs> uh, and we need to have resurgence. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I do think uh, the idea of where, you know, if we do where we're locating uh, hope and I don't even like resurgence because there's a weird kind of, you have like notions of what comes from the past and goes into the future is very limiting, right? So resurgence, but surgence, I don't know. Karen's better at awesome uh, usage of the language than I am, but I'm still kind of tied, but where is surgence? And I would say for me, um, really, um, you know, I was reading about how stars are born and, and uh, I, it's so, basic but i didn't know that stars you know form from hydrogen which gets so hot that it essentially creates the elements uh, all the other elements that exist uh, are forged in the fire of baby stars and then when the stars get old they explode and it's like a seed ball like basically all of these you know they're emanating these elements out into into the cosmos as they live but then at, when they die they just throw out all these things and what started as incredibly hot hydrogen then becomes all the stuff uh, all the elements that create everything that exists so it's like mini big bangs going on all the time uh, so i find that really like um, hopeful <laughs> um, but i'm curious uh, if anyone else uh, has uh, anything about uh, that that they wanted to talk about I just love your reflections on sound, Lisa. I think that that the way that sound travels through us and moves us, and part of what I'm still thinking through, and I tried to think through in that chapter on uh, the marrow thieves, is that 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 oral image that uh, that Dimmeline leaves us with an echo turned inside out. Right? She said, "I heard a sound like an echo turned inside out." Uh, and I love that idea of the echo um, as a, as time travel, right? I think Leanne Simpson talks really beautifully about this. She talks about, um, I forget the word, it's the name of a river, but how that saying that word transports her through time and space. And we see that happen with the characters in the Marrow Thieves too. Um, but then what does, what is this echo turned inside out mean? I, in one way, maybe it's about these linear circles and about how settler colonialism recuperates itself again and again, and these, these systems play out again. But the inside out is the interruption, um, is the break, the rupture um, that causes these new spaces. Um, but, but just that, that one, it's this one piece of poetry at the end of that book uh, that I, I think is so lovely, uh, and there's so much to do with, and I continue to think through. And I think I think using sound as a way to think through some of these issues of futurity um, uh, and rupture and apocalypse is a really fruitful place that I, I deserves more more attention. I think. If, if I may, um, I'd also like to pick up on the thread about fire. And um, recently, I've been reading a lot of um, Alexis Pauline Gum's work and thinking about. Um, like how we embrace fire as kin and thinking through um, kin alongside rupture, fire as, as relation really helps to, to pinpoint that fire in this sense is a, it's a, it's a futurist relation. And I'm thinking through the possibilities of um, 
you know, I think about the work of Michelle Murphy, my colleague at U of T and others who think about alter life, you know, how our bodily phenotypes develop responsiveness to chosen and unchosen chemicals. And the work of Alexis Pauline Gums is also suggesting that, you know, as a condition of our being together and our the things that are, we're going to be called to do is this like, is this training about how to be in relation with fire, how to breathe fire, how to train our bodies, um, our physicality to be in this relation with the core of the earth, right? So um, I'll just read a couple of um, things that uh, um, a par part of Alexis Pauline Gum's archive, so beautiful. Um, my teacher said, the training explained it, but I knew it had to be more than that. We were not just running across hot coals, jumping through blazing rings and juggling lit nunchucks anymore. We began to really breathe fire. Instead of extinguishing it with the damper of our breathing, we learned to ignite all the oxygen within us, hydrogen too, without the pain we thought would come from blackening our lungs. The acupuncturist said it was filtration, that we evolved systems to parse out the carbon that we are. I guess we all had our ways of making sense of it. And um, Alexis talks about the change. Um, and after the change, the message was different. Like the unseen didn't need a landing place. They wanted a spark. Like the cosmic vehicle needed an ignition and we made our bodies fossil fuels so now when they show up, we rise fevered and all of our breathing says is burn. <laughs> and that's Alexis Pauline Gum's archive of fire. And it is so brilliant. And I think it, it is a connection um, to, to what we're talking about in terms of um, possibilities. But I just wanted to give a shout out to Alexis Pauline Gum's brilliant um, poetics and brilliant theorizing. Did you want to add, uh, Dallas? Uh, it, uh, in terms of sound, uh, or no, I can't. I'm not going to be able to top what Karen just did. Like, <laughs> I that was amazing. That was Alexis, <laughs> man. <laughs> but doesn't Cree, Dallas? Doesn't Cree sound like birds singing? Like I listen to Cree language. And it it just sounds like like song. It sounds like birds. There's something really gorgeous and and sensuous and amazing about listening to Cree that is so it it just makes me so happy. Oh wow, Neheo Ewen sounds like the echo of stars. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I I actually really like that idea of the idea of Cree being, yeah, birds singing. It's I yeah, that's that's quite beautiful. I I think the only sort of uh I I love that about Cree and I and I do think Cree sounds that way, especially when you're hearing it spoken like fluently. But I also like how like literal Cree can be, and so I know there are some Cree speakers in here, and so I might be uh, uh, butchering some things. But I, but I do like the how literal Cree is. So I I don't I, I I don't know. I I always think about the word a Tim, which is dog, and the word Mister Tim, which is horse. And I just I I like to think of my ancestors on you know. On, on the prairies being like, oh, what's that thing? And uh, they just say, they don't say a Tim, they say Mr. Tim, that's just a big dog, but it's actually a horse. So I like, I, so I like the sort of, um, I like the, the sort of poet, like poetics of Cree, but I also incredibly enjoy how literal it is. And I think at times, um, I think at times that could be useful in terms of how we describe how we want to sort of relate to one another in in terms of just being very precise as opposed to you know dressing things up in sort of metaphor or all of these things but i do 
I do think it 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 it, it also sounds like the like um, bird song and it and it sounds like the stars and it sounds like all of these things. Cree's just yeah, I just I just love it. Thank you all. Um, there are some questions which we're going to get to now. We may not get to all of them. One thing I, I, um, Art Napoleon, who's a Cree speaker, said something about Cree, and it, I'm sorry I don't remember the Cree, the actual Cree words, but I remember uh, the idea, which was that um, there are certain things like wind or rain. You cannot say them as nouns in Cree. You can only say it is raining or it is winding uh, because there, it is not separate from the action of being um, or doing or however you wanna say that. So I thought that was really beautiful. Um, I'm gonna jump into the questions here um, and we have a few. So uh, we'll see if we can get through maybe two or three. Um, uh, Okay, so have you found indigenous futurisms or the practice of imagining otherwise to alter how you approach the past or how you understand personal or communal histories? As a fun aside, I'd also love to hear about your favorite works or creators of science fiction, movies, books, art, etc. What was the first half of that, that question again? Oh, you muted. I know. I thought I could do one. <laughs> you gotta have at least one. Uh, one day. Um, have you found indigenous futurisms or the practice of imagining otherwise to alter how you approach the past or how you understand personal or communal histories? How you approach the past or how you understand personal or communal histories? Or, and or there's a second part, which is like, what are your favorite? uh works or creators of science fiction I mean, there, there's so much there i grew up as a sci-fi nerd and there's so uh, so much but um uh, i the echo is where i find that idea of that relationship between past and future really interesting still and and uh, spivak has written really well she talks about the 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 echo as the uh the coming of a future the coming of a history not yet written um, so that this, this folding of a moment, right? Um, and I think Leanne Simpson's work speaks to that a lot too, right? How there is this movement, how language specifically moves us through time um, uh, in, in specific and really uh, interesting ways. Um, my, I'm gonna, my favorite spec fic people right now, uh, Josh Whitehead's um, book of poetry, um, uh, is is amazing, and also this the collection that he edited that I'm going to right now. I'd highly recommend that. And I mean, to come back to Afrofuturism, Octavia Butler. Like every go, just go out and get some Octavia Butler today, and sit yourself down with a cup of tea. <laughs> okay. Uh, if someone else uh, has anything, put up your hand. Otherwise, I'll move to another question. Wait, oh, oh, Karen, go ahead. It's okay, Dallas. Please go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to the to echo the Octavia Butler. I mean, one of the like guiding sort of phrases uh, that I sort of approach Indigenous futurisms through is one that comes from uh, Lou Cornum, uh, a Diné person, uh, and they're currently doing their work at uh, CUNY, I believe. Uh, but um, they have this great um, uh, article in the new inquiry I think it's called the space Indian star map and they uh, they quote Octavia Butler and it's uh, I, I didn't come across this quote until I read Lou's work and it was um, you know there's nothing new under the sun but there are new suns and I think that's something that we uh, that's, that's something I carry with me in terms of trying to think through how we're going to enact sort of different kind of um, um, worlds and so when I when I think about um, imagining otherwise, I sort of I I hold on to that Octavia Butler you know quote. In terms of uh, um, science fiction, movies, arts, works, um, uh, yeah, there's a whole there's Helen Hague Brown, um, 
There is, as Dave said, Joshua Whitehead. I think Billy Ray Belcourt's work is always very futuristic. I know that uh, Chelsea Vowell is writing a collection of um, futuristic works. Um, I know that Richard Van Camp does all the stuff there. There's just a sort of explosion of, um, and which isn't to suggest, and even Lisa, for instance, um, which, which isn't to suggest that this is all new work. In fact, it's been going on and and Dana Goulet and all these people and I think there's a reason why indigenous peoples have always thought about the future. I think we're we're trying to think outside of settler colonialism and so there's just a just whole uh, cultural and political production of work that I think we should be attuned to and it's just really really enlightening and uh, yeah I look uh, I look forward to reading more of it. I'm also like really inspired by Camille Turner's work um, on the Afronauts um, and particularly um, their work in Hush Harbor. Um, I'm also inspired by um, Debi Anita Africa's work. Oh my gosh, powerhouse, just gorgeous. Um, and, you know, thinking through right now, I'm, I'm, I actually assigned this to my students that might be a part of this uh, this conversation right now. So you're reading this, but um, N.K. Jemison's fifth fifth season. Um, I'm just like, wow, my mind is being exploded all the time. Um, thinking with uh, Nadia Korafor's work as well, um, who fears death and um, my the phoenix. Oh, gorgeous. Um, Nalo Hopkinson, um, Adrian Marie Brown for thinking about future gatherings and gatherings and emergence. Um, of course, Alexis Pauline Gums, I adore. I, there's so much brilliance there. Um, thinking alongside Black geographies, Black feminist geographies, Catherine McKittrick's work, Dion Brand's work. Um, there's just so much um, beauty. And in relation with you know, transmissions, um, be Dobbin, your work is so um, brilliant uh, that, you know, like even catching like little snippets of the work, because I haven't seen transmissions yet, I haven't embodied it yet, um, but I have been embodied with um, be Dobbin and, um, and the work and, and the digging and the sessing in relationship with N.K. Jemison's work. Like there's there's so much there um, that I'm just starting to in, engage in a way that uh, that um, just gives me goosebumps just thinking about, about it. So um, I just wanted to thank you, Lisa, for you and um, your incredible gifting to our futures and to our worlds. So I just always in awe of you and your, your practice, so. So much gratitude. Thanks, Lisa. Miigwech. Yeah, miigwech. Uh, wow, that's uh, so wonderful to hear. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and uh, and um, you know, it's an honor to make the work, and uh, it's an honor to hear back from people that I respect and that it's generative. And so we do exist in relationships. So I can say the same to you. Um, it's been fantastic to engage with you guys uh, in this, one of my uh, most embodied Zooms, I will say, from my perspective, um, this particular one. And I see that we're almost at time, so I apologize to everyone. There are some lovely questions, um, you know, but we're not going to get to them. <laughs> <laughs> but they involve the J Treaty, Mars Perseverance, um, how can we get out of colonialism to conceptualize space and time in English, uh, lots of brilliance in the questions, uh, and uh, more curiosity about what a futurity bundle is. So I would say if there's a very quick answer to where someone might be able to find out more about a futurity bundle, I think that's all we have time for before we go to a wrap up. Um, but I want to thank you all for having me uh, participate in this and, and thank the panelists and thank UBC and thank the very large number of you who are uh, with us here. Um, it's been an honor. Sorry, Futurity Bundles. Um... <laughs>
I did some writing <laughs> in the theater um, review uh, theater, and it's called Choreographies of the Fall, Futurity Bundles and Landings When Future Falls Are Imminent. I'll just put this um, in the chat. Thank you, Karen. And there is, uh, I think a couple people have uh, commented on resources. I see that there's a whole thing happening uh, and people are gonna be sharing those. So Cole can wrap us up and fill us in on that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Lisa. Um, I've really appreciated this time uh, that you've all shared with us today uh, and really feeling awestruck and, and humbled to have even been able to listen to the conversation. So I really appreciate everybody's time here today. Uh, and to everybody in the audience from Ursi and from Learning Circle, we wanted to echo what an amazing chat, a uh, very stimulating discussion and conversation. Yes, the resources are being codified as best we can. They were kind of coming at us rapid fire there. We hope to have gotten everything um, and you'll all receive an email with that as well as the YouTube link. We also had a question on closed captioning. Um, our YouTube videos will also come with that. So, if, you know, if you missed a few a piece or, or if you are hearing impaired for or if you know someone that's hearing impaired, we'll make sure to make that uh, resource accessible for you as well. Um, so as a wrap up, again, I can't thank you enough. David, Karen, Dallas, Lisa, amazing space, amazing conversation. Thank you all so much. Um, from the Learning Circle, circle and the Ursi standpoint, we'll be back again next month with uh, Margaret Kovach. Um, that'll be on the 25th of March. Uh, we'll be collaborating again from the Learning Circle standpoint. We have another session tomorrow on decolonizing sport. Tune in for that conversation. And then the following week, we're going to dive into cultural safety in uh, acute care settings. Um, so really looking forward to those discussions. Thanks, everybody, so much for your time. Until, until next time, take care. Bye-bye.